Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 40, Henry V's Cunning Plan. In this episode, we will see whether young King Henry V will do any better at ending the conflict between the Pope and the Emperor, featuring one of the most audacious political moves seen in this conflict. But before we start, just a reminder, the History of the Germans podcast is advertising free, thanks to the generous support from patrons. And you can become a patron too and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on my website historyofthegermans.com. you find all the links in the show notes. And thanks a lot to Ralph, Mehmet and Glenn who've already signed up. Last week we followed our anti-hero Henry IV to his last and final betrayal, when his youngest son, King Henry V, rose up against him, like his elder brother Conrad had done before. Henry V prevailed, and the old Emperor Henry IV died in 1106, still hoping against all the odds to return to the throne. The king is dead. Long live the king. But who is this new king, Henry V of his name? In 1105, Henry V was 21 years of age. He was born in 1086, in one of the quieter years of his father's reign. But just four years later did the emperor go down to Italy, where he would stay for seven years, most of which spent in impotent rage against the Pope, the Countess Matilda, the German princess and his son Conrad. We do not know whether young Henry was with his father during this time or whether he had stayed behind in Germany, and if so, where and with whom. Wherever he was... All his formative years were spent in some form of limbo, where he saw the ruler of the Reich being put under the yoke by his powerful vassals. In all likelihood, Henry V did believe that it wasn't easy to become king, and that it was even harder to remain king. With that in mind, we may have to retell the story of the end of Henry IV again. You see, last time you heard it from the point of view of the broken old emperor, being subjected to yet another round of treachery, lies and deceit. But now, let's take a look at these events from the viewpoint of young King Henry V. For him, the year 1105 had become decision time. His father was old, so his last days were nigh. And at the same time, the old man had been unable to reconcile with the Pope, which meant that his rule was fragile and his succession was even more so. Henry V's worst case scenario was that his father would suddenly die and the Gregorian party would then propose their own candidate as king. All Henry V could then rely upon was that he had been formally elected, anointed and crowned in 1099 and that all the magnates had sworn fealty to him. But what is that worth? His own father had been elected, anointed and crowned when the magnates deposed him in 1076. All it needed was a Gregorian Pope to excommunicate him, and all that frankincense and myrrh would fade into nothingness. So as far as Henry V was concerned, his father needed to reconcile with the Pope pronto, or the new king's reign would start with a civil war. After the murder of Count Sicard and the subsequent Bavarian uprising, that reconciliation would not happen for a long, long time. Pope Pachale's policy is reinvigorated, and he can again see the opportunity of maybe, maybe unseating Henry IV after all. And if he was unwilling to compromise when Henry IV was well established, on what basis would he do it now? Well, there was one way Henry IV could achieve a reconciliation with the Pope, and that was by giving up all the investiture rights, the last remaining open issue between the Pope and the Emperor. But that would also mean that the Empire would be finished. No investiture rights means no power over bishops, which means no call on Episcopal military, which means no central power. And that would be the worst of all worlds for Henry V, a contested succession to an Empire that was barely worth of its name. And that also means... The only way to avoid that outcome was to take over right now, put himself at the head of the Gregorian party and take a step at reconciling with the Pope. 
And he made his point very clear in a speech before the magnates, where he said that he wasn't fighting against his father, but on behalf of his father's realm. The realm had become something that was truly detached from the person of the emperor, a concept first put out by Conrad II almost a hundred years earlier. The individual emperor had to protect the realm, even if it meant acting against his filial duties. In light of that, I simply do not understand why some historians accuse Henry V of ruthless ambition. Yes, the way he had lured his father into the prison of Böckelheim may have not been cricket, but there he stood, and he could do no other. And if we look at the end result from the perspective of the empire, the situation had improved massively under Henry V. The empire recognized Pope Paschalis II, Urban II's successor. The schism was over. Each bishopric now has only one bishop, so that no priest has to worry any more whether he was canonically appointed, and no parishioner has to ask whether the baptism, marriage or last rites were valid. The Pope has endorsed and absolved the king, meaning everyone can now fulfill their oath to the king without opposing the church. And so, the magnates recognized Henry V as their king and future emperor, and a major civil war has been avoided. The country is at peace. And for the next four years, the magnates remained supportive of the young king. The king listens to their counsel and makes a number of fairly sensible decisions. One of these related to the succession of the Duke of Saxony. Saxony, as you may remember, had been a hereditary duchy for some time, and its ducal family, the Billungs, had ruled, in inverted commas, the duchy since the time of Otto the Great. You see, the dukes were not massively powerful, given that some of the Saxon counts ruled territories large enough to be dukedoms in their own right. The last of the Billung dukes, Magnus, had died in 1106, and he had two daughters, who were each married to one of these extremely powerful Saxon counts. If Henry had granted the duchy to either of these, the other would have contested the election, and Saxony would have descended into civil war. To avoid that, Henry chose a compromise candidate, Lothar of Supplinburg. Lothar was related to all the major families in Saxony and even some of the Bavarian Lothringian magnates. But he did not have much of a power base himself. And that made him a popular candidate with all concerned. Remember the name, Lothar of Supplinburg, because we will find out in a few episodes that all concerned does not include King Henry V and his heirs. Now apart from the Saxon succession, the other key imperial job was to keep an eye, and occasionally throw a lance, at the restless neighbours, namely the still irritating Counts of Flanders, the Dukes of Lower Lothringia and assorted other potentates in the West. As for the East, the pattern that emerges is that both Poland and Hungary drift out of the influence of the Empire. Poland is increasingly looking even further east to Russia and the Baltic seaboard, rather than getting involved in imperial affairs. Hungary is expanding south. Its king became king of Croatia as well in 1102. Along with this southward focus, Hungary moved closer to Constantinople, taking a neutral, if not sometimes hostile, stance towards the empire. Henry V tried to assert his increasingly theoretical suzerainty by supporting a pretender to the crown of Hungary, as Henry III had done before. But like him, the policy ultimately failed, and Hungary will remain outside the empire. In Bohemia, i.e. what is today the Czech Republic, it's the opposite. The Dukes of Bohemia were roped even further into the empire, as they were looking for support in their eternal internal family feuds. In 1114, the then Duke of Bohemia confirmed his vassal status to the emperor by accepting one of the Erzämter, or arch officers of the realm. He became the arch cupbearer to the emperor. And for the next few thousand imperial pints, Bohemia will be an integral part of the empire. With the country at peace and the borders more or less calm, there remained only one really big issue to be resolved, and that was the conflict over the investiture of the bishops. Henry V had managed to gain papal support for his rebellion without having to renounce royal investiture. His smart move was not to negotiate with Paschalis beforehand. 
Hence the Pope was as surprised about events as everyone else. When Henry V asked to be absolved from the oath to his father, there was no time for the two sides to discuss investiture. Pashalis had to choose to either refuse absolution, and the rebellion would have collapsed, leaving him to continue negotiating with the intractable Henry IV, or to grant the absolution without conditions and see what happens next. He chose option two. And that meant once Henry V ascended the throne, he continued to select and invest bishops with ring and staff, as his father, grandfather and great-grandfather had done. The Pope, on the other hand, kept insisting on the total ban on royal investiture, including a ban on churchmen giving an oath of vassalage to the kings. The problem was intractable, and though both sides tried to remain civil and no excommunication was yet forthcoming, tensions are mounting. Whilst Paschalis and Henry V are gradually falling out, there is some movement in the debate about the investiture outside the empire. Let us not forget that the right to invest bishops and abbots is a topic not just in the empire, but all across Europe. The King of France and the King of England are also at loggerheads with the papacy over this question. The King of France needs investiture mainly because otherwise he would be pretty much bankrupt. The King of England has more money, but he had been relying on the church in England and Normandy for his financial and military resources, pretty much in the same way as the empress have done in Germany. As a consequence, there were similar struggles in France and England between the supporters of the Gregorian reform and the kings. In England, it was the fight between Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury, and the kings William Rufus and Henry I. In France, the king had so many issues with the papacy, the investiture conflict was outsourced to his bishops. It culminated in the debate over the succession to the bishoprics of Sens and Beauvais. Maybe because of the less intense royal involvement, France was the first to reach a breakthrough. The great canonical jurist Ivo of Chartres came up with the concept that royal investiture had nothing to do with the spiritual role of the bishop. All it did was to grant the bishop lands and rights from the king in exchange for the oath of fealty, as regards his obligations as a vassal. Apart from that oath, the bishop remained free and his role as a spiritual leader was unaffected. That model was gradually accepted, and it ended up in a modus operandi where the king would not hand over the symbols of the bishop's spiritual role, i.e. the ring and the staff, but the bishop would swear him an oath of fealty, and presumably pay for taking on the fiefs. In England, the struggle also involved the exchange of many a learned treatise one of which even claimed the opposite of the Gregorian doctrine, i.e. that the king is, by his anointment, put at top of the church. After a lot of to and fro in 1107, the King of England and the Pope agreed the Concordat of Westminster. That sets out that, as in France, the spiritual investiture was a purely church affair, but that the new prelate was to make an oath of fealty to the king as regards his fiefs. The royal rights in England, however, go further than in France. The king has the right to be present at the election of a bishop or abbot, and, in case of disagreement, has the casting vote. In that arrangement, the king remained pretty much in charge of his church. Whilst France and England reach an agreement, the negotiations between Paschalis and Henry IV are not going so well. In the first round in November 1106, both sides remained stubborn and Bashalis reaffirmed the complete ban on royal investiture. A delegation of German bishops and even a number of temporal lords with impeccable Gregorian leanings meet with a representative of Pope Bashalis in May 1107, but again, negotiations run into the ground. So while he refused any compromise with the German side, Pope Bashalis goes to France and celebrates a solemn mass with King Philip I and his son Louis VI in the church of Saint-Denis. That puts a seal of approval on the unofficial agreement over investiture, and also over some other issues relating to the sexual incontinence French monarchs are so famous for. And the church of Saint-Denis is of huge significance here, as it is the same church where Pope Stephen II had crowned Pippin the Short and his son 
the future Emperor Charlemagne. The implication of this ceremony in 1107 is straightforward. The Pope wants the kings of France to take over the role of leader of Christendom from that evil tyrant from across the Meuse River, our friend King Henry V. The journeys of Pope Urban II to France had already laid the foundations for this alliance between the French monarchy and the papacy. The events of Saint-Denis simply made them public and for all to see. And over the next centuries, the Capetian kings will use this papal endorsement to forge a coherent kingdom out of a hodgepodge of lands and rights around Paris. This support culminates a hundred years later in the Albigensian Crusade, where the Pope promises a free ticket to heaven for anyone, helping to bring the south of France under royal control. The French monarchs rewarded such support another century later with the installation of the papacy in Avignon under the watchful eye of a French garrison across the Rhone. Sorry, I digress. Back to the year 1107. As the Pope moves closer to the French and agrees to concordat with the King of England, he remains unmoved to the pleas of King Henry V. By now the German side realises that the full investiture with ring and staff is no longer to be retained. In treatises presumably sponsored by the court, German writers begin to differentiate very clearly between the spiritual role and the secular role of the bishop, suggesting solutions along the lines of what had been agreed with France and England. But again, the German delegations are rebuffed by Pope Paschalis II. There's now only one thing to do. The king and the pope have to meet and to thresh out their differences. But before he sets off, Henry V lays the foundations for another axis of European politics that lasted more or less until the First World War. He gets engaged to Matilda, daughter of King Henry I of England. She was at the time just eight years old and the only surviving child of the Norman king. English history knows her as the Empress Matilda, adversary of King Stephen in the Anarchy and mother of King Henry II, the first of the Plantagenet kings of England. This marriage was, as all other medieval marriages were, a political one. As the papacy had aligned itself with France, Henry was looking for a counterweight. And who could be better than the King of England, who was also Duke of Normandy and hence in perennial squabbles with his southern neighbour? The English Henry was also rich, and he provided £10,000 of silver as a dowry, which was surely welcome. A slight problem was that the bride was only eight years old, so the marriage could not yet be consummated. Therefore, the happy couple could only get engaged. Now, the King of England was not prepared to hand over this kind of money for a mere engagement. So, instead of getting married, little Matilda is crowned queen in Mainz. Matilda will spend the next few years being educated by German bishops until Henry marries her when she turned 11. One hopes the consummation was still delayed by a few years after that. His pockets refilled, Henry V sets off for Rome in the summer of 1110 and, as usual, spends the winter in Lombardy. He signs a standstill agreement with the Countess Matilda, who is still there, holding the keys to Rome. In February 1111, Henry V arrives at the gates of the Eternal City. The timing could not have been worse for Paschalis II. Like his predecessors, he relied on the support of the Normans and of the Countess Matilda in his squabbles with the Emperor. Now Matilda had already decided to stand aside this time. And in a terrible twist of fate for the Pope, the two leaders of the Normans, Roger of Apulia and Boimund of Antioch, died right around this time. Their future leader, Count Roger II of Sicily, was still a child. So there was no hope for Norman support. What to do now? At this point, Paschalis II comes up with a plan. To say it in the words of the inimitable Baldrick, a plan so cunning you can put a tail on it and call it a weasel. Here's version 1 and how this plan came about. Pope Paschalis is a true Gregorian reformer, who cares little about worldly politics, but a lot about the well-being of the Holy Mother Church. And as he contemplates how to solve the problem of lay interference in the appointment of bishops, he has an idea. 
The king does not want to control the spiritual role of the bishops and abbots. That's not why he wants the investiture. He needs investiture only because he needs access to the church's financial and military resources. So, what about the church handing back all these counties, castles, market rights, mints, mills and farms to the king? And in exchange, the king completely withdraws from any interference with his bishops. Isn't that the best solution? The church is free from royal interference and the king has no longer any need to interfere. Brilliant. And so he makes exactly that proposal to Henry V as the king approaches Rome. Henry V must have been dumbfounded by such an unimaginably generous offer. There are no real statistics, but the estimate is that the church owned about one third of the lands of Western Europe, and probably even more in Germany given the incessant transfer of land and titles to the bishops under the imperial church system. So, a generous offer indeed. His advisers and even the king himself has doubts about the feasibility of this plan. How will the royal court administrate these enormous estates? Can you recruit enough ministeriales to manage it? Now what about the bishops and the abbots' reactions? But Henry V takes the offer. An agreement is signed and on February 12th he enters Rome for his coronation. He greets the Pope on the steps of St. Peter and kisses the Holy Father's feet. As is tradition, he swears to be the protector and defender of the Holy Church in all ways he could be of help. The next part of the coronation would be the scrutinium, an assessment of the fitness of the candidate to become emperor. It is here that Henry V formally renounces the right to invest the bishops. And that is followed by the reading of the papal charter, whereby the Pope orders the bishops and abbots to hand back all the lands they own, every county, castle, farm and mill, apart from those they had received as donations from private individuals. And the result of this plan that was to please everyone was total mayhem. The clergyman present had not been advised of the arrangement beforehand. In fact, the whole treaty had been negotiated in secret between the king's advisers and a small number of the Pope's confidants. These mighty bishops and abbots were not at all keen to give up their lands, nor were the secular lords pleased with the outcome. Many of them held fiefs from the church, which they assumed would be lost to some ruddy ministerialis under this arrangement. Shouts went up, swords were drawn, crucifixes hurled, and Rome broke out into rioting. The coronation had to be suspended. The parties tried to negotiate in the middle of the chaos. Henry insisted on the coronation and, since the Pope was unable to hold his side of the bargain, demanded acceptance of his right of investiture. No agreement could be reached and by nightfall, the still only king, Henry V, took the Pope and his cardinal along to his army camp near Ponte Mamolo, just outside the walls. For two months, the Pope and his cardinals refused to agree to Henry's demands until they finally caved on April the 12th. We don't know why. The Pope and the Cardinals issued a privilege to Henry V that allowed him to invest his bishops with both ring and staff, basically allowing him to run the imperial church exactly as his ancestors had been able to. Furthermore, he swore an oath to never bother the king again about investiture and to never excommunicate him. In exchange, the king released his prisoners and swore allegiance to the Pope and the Holy Church. And then there was a little side deal with Pasharis II, whereby he released the old Emperor Henry IV from his excommunication, which meant he could finally be buried in his cathedral in Speyer. All that was sealed off with the coronation of the Emperor Henry V, which finally took place on April the 13th. In May, the freshly minted Emperor sets off home. And on the way home, he scored another victory. He convinced the childless Countess Matilda to name the emperor himself as the heir to her enormous wealth. How that happened? I have no idea. She had previously promised her lands to the seat of St. Peter. All this looks like Henry V had achieved a complete triumph. He has been crowned emperor 
the investiture controversy is resolved in such a way that all the imperial rights are protected. He is safe from any excommunication or papal interference and, to top it off, the Empire gets hold of Matilda's lands. Really brilliant, eh? No, not really. The agreement with the Pope was so blatantly brought about by force, it was easily renounced. That happened as early as 1112 at a synod in Rome. The document was now called the privilege, the depraved privilege. Without waiting for any papal authorization, several Gregorian bishops excommunicated Henry V, a process that was repeated multiple times throughout the rest of his reign. And as for the inheritance of Matilda, the competing claims of Pope and Emperor were added to the long list of their differences. But the most severe impact was on his own vassals. When Henry V agreed to have his bishops and many of his magnates stripped of their possessions, the spectre of an overbearing Salian emperor returned. The great lords had believed Henry V had become one of them, had understood that all the title provided was a role as the first amongst equals, that he was supposed to listen to his magnates' advice in all his endeavours and was bound to protect their rights and privileges. But with the acceptance of Pashale's offer, he revealed himself as a man in the mould of his father and all his predecessors, a man who wanted to consolidate central power, push down the princes into mere royal subjects, and rule as a Roman emperor, not as a Germanic king. And as the emperor's perception changed and the excommunications began to rain down, Henry V's reign begins to more and more resemble the reign of his father. Maybe... That was the true motive behind Pashale's plan all along. Maybe the plan was really as cunning as a weasel. Next week we will see how Henry V handles this turn of the Wheel of Fortune. I hope to see you then. And in the meantime, should you feel like supporting the show and get hold of those bonus episodes, sign up on Patreon. The links are in the show notes or on my website at historyofthegermans.com. <laughs>